Hi, welcome to Build It Better. My name is Adam Clark, and I'm a full stack engineer at This Dot Labs. Today, I'm here with Lee Robinson from Vercel. Lee, thanks for joining. Hi, thanks for having me. It is our pleasure. So our goal for Build It Better is to introduce developers to the best tools and technology for building out their own apps. And so when it comes to hosting platforms, there's tons of choices these days. Um, so today, Lee's going to tell us about Vercel and why it should matter to you. So Lee, uh, can you tell me, I guess first we'll, we'll go broad, you know, what is Vercel? Like give me an elevator pitch for Vercel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Vercel is a platform and a place for front-end developers and front-end teams. So it is a place for you to host, deploy and manage your applications, um, specifically things like static or hybrid sites, serverless functions, and uh, a place to host serverless applications. Cool. So you guys are focused mainly on the on the serverless kind of like functions as a service, Jamstack, um, static sites with APIs on the back end kind of thing. That's cool. So so what kind of developers are you guys really trying to target? Are you guys focused on a certain subgroup or are you know or what? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So Vercel, well, if we even go back further, before it was Vercel, it was called Zite. And we look at the history of the company, it started off uh, more focused around the server full approach and has since transitioned to more of the serverless approach. Okay. And the reason for that also too is, you know, Vercel started as a place really just for developers. And then throughout its evolution, it's really evolved to be kind of this hub of collaboration for developers, designers, people in product, other stakeholders. And the, the target market there is really empowering front-end teams to deliver business value, deliver some high quality output. And really that collaboration piece is all rooted around the atomic piece of a preview deployment. So our kind of the mantra that we have is called develop preview ship. Mm. And in this life cycle, a lot of teams completely miss that preview part of the workflow. So they develop and they go straight to prod and they hope for the best, or they <laughs> don't have the infrastructure or the resources to have those preview deployments available. And what we've found is these, these preview deployments are kind of the bridge between these different worlds and between these different collaborators. So when you push code, each change gets a live URL where developers, testers, any other stakeholders get an actual stakeholders get to verify visually that things work as expected. They can run automated tests, end-to-end -end tests, et cetera. So this has really changed the game uh, as far as how people collaborate. And then building on top of that, developers and front-end teams that use Vercel use it for not only the simplified developer experience, but then also a lot of people are using Vercel for Next.js which is we can talk more about later, but it is the most popular JavaScript framework for the front end. And it is built on top of React. And it essentially simplifies building high quality performant React applications um, and bakes in a lot of opinions by default uh, rather than the various ways you can build a React application from scratch, I guess. Sure. So Next.js is something that you guys developed in house, right? Yeah. So. Vercel is really like the, the platform built for Next.js. So the team at Vercel built this Next.js framework um, going back you know, many years now. And it has since evolved from originally being a kind of pioneering the approach of a zero configuration. And you know, I want to build a React application, but I don't want to have any of the ceremony of configuring all the pieces, right? It really pioneered that. And it also introduced... I want to server side render my React application and I want to simplify that process because it was possible to do it before, but it was always kind of difficult. Um, so Next.js gave you the easy way to do that. And then if we go forward in time, even a little bit more with 9.3 release, we added support for complete static site generation, which you might have used before with things like Jekyll or Hugo or Gatsby in the React space um, to where we are today. And where we are today and kind of who the target developers who use Next.js and Vercel and the target markets are people who want to build hybrid applications. And now really what this means is 
everybody's application starts out with just a few pages, right? And the reality is as it grows and it grows and it grows, you need to have the flexibility to choose, depending on the route, how you wanna render your site. So if you're locked in entirely to a single page application style, like client side only, that has drawbacks. If you're locked into only server rendering, then it has drawbacks of losing some of that client side interactivity. And what we've found from working with some of the biggest customers in the world who use Next.js in production is that they want it all. Like they want to have their cake and eat it too. And they need a framework that can do both and do multiple different types of rendering um, all without having to leave your framework. So as your site grows, you don't want to have to jump and change frameworks and go to something else. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that, you know, uh, through my career, I've dealt with that. You know, I've been in consulting for a long time and you do, you know, you build a lot of greenfield apps for people, MVP products for people. And, uh, you know, you need to be able to pivot from into that next step. So that's that's really cool that Next.js kind of bridges that gap between, all right, let's get something out there. And OK, this is a real product that we're going to invest a lot of time into. So we need to be able to grow. So that's that's excellent. So um, that's a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, so like, I mean, you've already kind of explained some of it with ne with having like Next.js being attached attached to the platform. Um, but what sets for sale apart from, from other competitors? You know, there's a lot of places to get, you know, to host your functions as a service and to host your, your static apps. You know, you can go, you can yep. go to AWS and do it the hard way or, or you even use AWS Amplify, mm -hmm. which is like AWS easy mode, I guess is what they're trying to build it as. Yeah. Um, you know, so so why why Vercel instead of instead of one of those? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that's important to clarify: Vercel can technically host any type of front end applications. It could do Next.js, or it could do Gatsby, or Svelte, or Nuxt, or really whatever you want to do. Um, but because Vercel also created Next.js, that's where we have the most affinity to, or the most um, tight integration with. So any new feature that's released in Next.js, it's going to have first class support. It's going to work out of the box on our platform. So as we've seen Next.js grow now to over half a million developers and just an amazing community growing around that, lots of people contributing on GitHub. So we're really appreciative of those people. Um, it's allowed the team at Vercel to partner with other people in this space. So we have partnerships with the React team at Facebook and also the Google Chrome team. And that partnership actually allows some of those people on the Chrome team to work full time on Next.js, helping us um, basically embed the best practices for web performance and have it affect change at a large scale. So if you think about the incentives or the motives for the Chrome team, right? They want to help the world have more performant websites. They want to improve that experience to as many places as they can. And what they found is one really good avenue for them to help drive change was to collaborate with framework authors and put some of these best practices directly into the framework. And the first uh, incarnation of this, I guess, was the Next.js image component and automatic image optimization, which was included in Next.js 10. And this helps bring all of the research and work that the Chrome team has done on image optimization and you know, having good core web vitals, which are essentially performance metrics and baking those into the framework so that it's easy for people just to upgrade and get access to those things. So those partnerships are a really big piece of Next.js and, and really how it's growing. But then when we think about the Vercel platform, there's really a couple different pieces. We wanna make it so when you deploy Next.js on Vercel, you don't have to worry about any infrastructure. When you're deploying serverless, it's like you said, it's like the easy mode, right? You just deploy it, it scales, and you don't have to worry about anything. So not only does the framework scale from one to millions of different pages, but also the underlying infrastructure scales so that you don't have to worry about what happens if my site hits the front page of Hacker News or if it gets featured in the Washington Post, which is actually one of our customers. So it really can go very far. And the, the next step of that, once you've developed, you've previewed, and you shipped is now how do I measure and iterate on what I've released? And we have a product called Next.js Analytics um, that's built into the Vercel platform, just Vercel Analytics. It actually works for Gatsby too. But this allows you to track performance metrics like Core Web Vitals over time. So we realize that you know when you deploy your application, your job isn't done. It's still entirely possible to 
create a React application that is not performant at all because you put millions of lines of, of crappy code, right? Like it's still right. possible to do that. So we want to make sure that when people release changes or they add packages or make updates to their site, they're getting that feedback to understand if there was a regression introduced. And this is really important because these core web vitals are actually affecting not only the user experience of your site, but also search engine ranking starting in May of this year. So these vitals teams, we've talked to so many enterprise teams who are constantly monitoring these vitals, trying to figure out how they can make them better so that they don't get dinged you know, and drop down in search results. So those are a few things that I really enjoy about the Vercel platform. You know, Before I worked at Vercel, I was a big advocate for it and I used I used it for all my projects or all my, tried to convince the people I worked with to use it too. So yeah, I, I'm very, very fond of the platform. That's really cool. I mean, I'm really into this like integrated, like analytics and and, and monitoring stuff that's becoming more popular. Um, that was one of the big, the big, you know, improvements that Heroku made once they started to get, you know, more competition from the likes of Vercel and, and other uh, Netlify and other kind of, uh, server full, but not serve like, but, but also serverless mm -hmm. kind of hosting platforms. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm really loving seeing more of those features integrated into some of these platforms as a first class kind of, it's the first thing you see when you go to, when you go to your dashboard is some of these analytics about, you know, like your app is slow, fix it <laughs> mm -hmm. without having to go to like new relic or like install a whole monitoring suite or, you know, using a third party piece of software that, you know, is another expense and another, you know, just, it's all stacks on top of each other, right? So having it all kind of in the same place is, is really cool. Um, you're talking about the, the previews. Um, previews is something I've worked with, you know, recently. I do a lot of work with Kubernetes, mm -hmm. uh, so real heavy hosting platforms. Um, and previews is like the big thing that everybody wants. And man, mm -hmm. trying to implement, I'm, I've been using like GitHub, like a combination of GitHub Actions and Argo CD and like three different services to kind of like wire up these preview apps. And it doesn't even like, I still haven't solved all the problems. It's still quirky. So so preview apps are really cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like how that functionality works and like how simple it is to, to get that going? Yeah, um, I would say the most common use case for using preview deployments is with our Git integrations. So whether you're using GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, um, essentially you push some code some, some commit, whether it's directly to your main branch or to a PR, you push some code and our integration will automatically recognize that, kick off a build, and then leave a comment back with a link to the live URL as well as the deploy logs. And these URLs are immutable. So you can basically have snapshots of your code in time, which is super, super valuable, especially from a rollback perspective. So when you go to production, it's really easy then to promote a different build to production if you introduce some kind of regression. So not only is it good for a testing standpoint and being able to, you know, I don't have to go to this PR, check out the branch locally, get it set up running with environment variables. Like I just have a URL. Um, it's really interesting too, because we talk to enterprise clients like Airbnb who use Vercel and next, they use Vercel not even for production hosting, but specifically for that collaboration piece. So as you can imagine, Airbnb has, you know, strict requirements on their production hosting for security. And what they do is they use Vercel's preview deployments to collaborate with stakeholders and to take to executive reviews and to simplify that process of developing and previewing. And then after that, then they hand it off to their secure production environment. That's actually really cool. I never even really thought about that as a as a you know a, a good usage you know use case for for a secondary platform. Even if you are on something like you know really big and heavy like Kubernetes, because you've got you know all yeah. these different microservices and whatever that that need to talk to each other and 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 like that. And having having that just kind of take taken away from having to like make your DevOps team implement those C CI/CD workflows for for those preview apps. I mean, it's, it's one of the least trivial things I've ever worked on. You know, CICD is so easy these days until, until you start, until you start doing stuff like that. And it's just like, I'm, I'm right now dealing with, with uh, a client who, who wants preview apps, but uses OAuth, GitHub OAuth for their primary sign-in mechanism. Yeah. And so like, you know, that's a whole can of worms. So it's, it's, I love, I love platforms that really, you know, at least take away 
simplify the the parts that should be easy that that for some reason still aren't. Uh, Absolutely. So, Vercel, you guys are are, are targeting uh, you know Java Node.js platforms and and static you know front end JS platforms. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any? Do, are there any plans to to extend support to other platforms? Or are you guys really happy just kind of staying in your in your next JS? You know, or not? I know you said that you support other JavaScript platforms, mm-hmm. but are you guys really focused in on those JavaScript and Node.js um, applications? Or are you are you thinking that that over the next you know however long that that you'll branch out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're focused on serverless. And with serverless, that could be, we have support for Go, Dart. There's some community runtimes for um, all sorts of other languages that people want to use, as long as it's in a serverless manner. So we're focused on serverless and we're focused on hybrid applications. So when you think towards the future, it's things like Next.js, it's things like Nux, it's things like SvelteKit. These are frameworks and tools that are going to allow people to build highly scalable applications that aren't, you know, locked into just SSG stack side generation or just client side rendering, they give that flexibility. So it's not necessarily just Next.js, even though we obviously like Next.js a lot, you know, we want to be the first class citizen for all of those different types of frameworks. Cool. Um, so that's, that's really cool. So like, let's talk about Maybe if you could like give a, a run through of like if I'm starting a brand new Next.js app mm-hmm. and I've got some some you know I've got I've got it's I'm thinking I'm going to build you know mostly static static stuff but I'll have a couple APIs that I need to work with to like reach out for some data. Tell me a little bit about how you know the optimal way to maybe start that project is and to like get up and running in the least amount of time on on Vercel. So I lied. Uh, I do want to share my screen. Uh, okay. to show this if that's okay no that's absolutely fine uh just go ahead and 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 you can press the buttons um absolutely and, uh, and hopefully we can get them to edit this out and post <laughs> <laughs> awesome all right uh, if you're ready, i'll go ahead and add it to the add it to the stream go for it perfect okay this looks good let me just pull up my uh size here a little bit so yeah i would recommend the easiest way to get started with Vercel and with Next.js is using our import workflow. So you can either start from any Git URL or you can use templates that we've defined. So I'm using this Next.js template here. And let's say I wanna go to my personal account. Um, We're gonna say, I wanna use GitHub. That's where things are set up. You're gonna name whatever you want your repository to be. I'm just gonna do private for this, hit continue. You can override settings here as necessary, but I'm not really gonna need to do anything. I'm just gonna hit deploy. And this is gonna kick off that build. And this should take about a minute. And what I wanna do in the meantime is talk about uh, analytics, which I think is really interesting. So this is this will kick off and it'll run, but while that's going, um, and once this gets shipped to production, this is what I was talking about with constantly measuring and monitoring how your site performs. So what we're looking at here is live data for our documentation site at Vercel.com slash docs. And you see that for the last day, we have 25,000 data points. And overall, our score, our real experience score, which is basically a a summary of the different core web vitals we have down below, gives us a pretty good health check of how our site is doing. And on the right here, we get a uh, C when you make commits and you deploy your application, you see these dotted lines actually represent when that deployment was. So you're it's really clear if you made a commit or you introduced a regression where that was as you would see your, uh, your vitals drop down. And on the inverse too, when you make improvements, you obviously wanna see those go up. So this has been really helpful for us to analyze what's going good, what's going bad, you know, maybe where we have layout shift, we want to reduce that as much as possible. So the, the UI isn't jumping around wherever we want to, you know, reduce input delay and even going further, like breaking it down on a per page or per URL level. So you can see if one page is performing specifically worse than others. Uh, if we go back here, it looks like it's finished deploying. We get our confetti. It says, Hey, it worked. So I can go view this or I can go look at my project in the dashboard. And yeah, this is kind of the hello world application. 
you can deploy in basically a minute. So it's really, really quick to get started, get going. You can then clone this repo locally, hack away on it. Or, you know, I could just go into GitHub and actually make a change, hit deploy and see it live. So it's it's really simple to get going. It's actually mind blowing because, you know, when I think about me developing web apps five years ago, it's like it was it was much harder than this. Yeah, I mean, just this stuff alone would take, you know, a good half a day or a day sometimes, depending on your framework. So Absolutely. Um, even... And that's and that's assuming that you were that you were pushing it straight to you know that that, that you're using Heroku or mm -hmm. or something you know something that really makes it easy for you Elastic Beanstalk but even Elastic Beanstalk can be harder than 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 Heroku that's that's really cool so one one metric you you glossed over there on the analytics page that, mm -hmm. that I'm interested in that I haven't really seen tracked before is the layout shift. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit more about how you guys you know like how you guys determine that and kind of what that metric means. Absolutely. So the best way to think about layout shift, I think where you see it the most is with web fonts. So if you've ever been on a page that's loading some external web font to improve the branding or improve the design, um, and you see that shift, <laughs> like once the page loads, it's a really jarring experience. Yeah. And so kind of that, that flash of unstyled content kind of, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, really, there's there's two two big offenders there that are equally bad. Flash of unstyled content where you just see the shell and then the text come in or the flash of uh, invisible text where it's like, ooh, it's just really bad. Um, so I would say that's probably number one. Number two would be, you know, when I'm loading this analytics layout, let's say I had some hypercritical button here that I needed to make sure didn't move. You notice when I reload this page, we have this nice loading skeleton so that there's no layout shift and things just, you know, naturally come in and it makes it look really, really smooth. But let's say there's like a big delete button right here and I'm, I'm trying to unsubscribe. Like I need to get out of this right away. And you go to click on it and then your layout shifts and you accidentally like do something that you completely didn't intend to. This happens all the time for me on, I don't know, like New York Times or something, we could just go to a random website. You'll probably see, I mean, you saw right there, the the font shift, if I do like the hard hard refresh. Mm -hmm. And it's just not, it's not great. But the thing is, you have this because these web fonts are critical to the brand that you're trying to portray. So you can't, you can't really fault people for using web fonts. Like basically, I'd have to look at the exact metric, but it's like 80% of websites are using some web font. Like it's it's extremely common. So what the Chrome team and just the larger web performance working group has been trying to fix and people, you know, the CSS spec authors too, is with font display optional. And that's what we use on Vercel.com. Basically, uh, if you can load the web font in a certain amount of time, then it will use that. Otherwise, it will swap out to whatever your fallback is without having that layout shift. So it basically provides the best experience if you're performance focused. For some brands, this is non-negotiable. They, they care more about having that unique brand font than they do having, uh, you know, just the best performance, which you know, to each their own, right? To each their own. But for us, that performance is the most important which is why we use font display optional so that there's not layout shift and things load as, as quickly as possible. So if you're on a slow connection, right, then uh, let's, I can see if I can demo it here. If I go to a network tab, let's go to like fast 3G and refresh this page, hard refresh. We'll see if we can get it to go. So it looks like enter still loaded in that case. Uh, maybe I can go to my site and try the same thing. Go to slow 3G. Wait for this to load. Yeah, now let me inspect this. See if I can find it in here. That's what I want. Um, hmm. 
Well, maybe not. <laughs> That's fine. I'm having a small lighting technical difficulty. Give me just a moment. Right. Okay. Well, um, so, yeah, I was hoping to find the network request in here that would show it. But I mean, as you see, when I hard reload the page, I'm not seeing layout shift from my font. And if I take, um, if I take this off and put it online and then I refresh, you see how then it changed. Mm -hmm. And that's because I was on my fast connection speed where I was able to download that custom web font. And now when I refresh, you know, I just use that every single time. So I don't have the network request in here. See if I can, yeah, here, here it is. So yeah, that's, that's cumulative layout shift uh, and why it's important to make sure well, that, that, you're that one's really cool to track because you know, that's something that that's been a problem for people. I think as long as we've been building rich sites with JavaScript, even when we're just using jQuery, you know, I mean, flash one style content is, is, is nothing new. And, you know, one of the most frustrating things about that is, is as developers, we often have powerful machines and, and, you know, aren't, aren't thinking to go press that slow 3g button in Chrome. And so we aren't even necessarily seeing these things that maybe some users who are on a, you know, five-year-old laptop um, are, are experiencing. So, so I think it's, it's, it's cool that you guys are tracking even things like that. So people really, you know, so developers can really understand uh, what's wrong with their site. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can see the big red, like, Hey, this is slow or, Hey, your site jumps all over the place all the time when people mm -hmm. are doing it. Um, having access to that, you know, just a click away from from your deployments, and and then also seeing that lined up with with deployments and in exact, like you said, like snapshots of code, and being able to say, well, this point in time of our code was was more performant in all the core core metrics than everything that came back came after it. So you know what? Let's just go ahead and back up to there and and go back to the drawing board, right? Like to think about to think about how we need to improve the you know our, our or, you know, here's some features that we really need to focus on on optimizing mm -hmm. uh, versus like everything's fine, right? So it's really easy, I think, to, to, to get trapped in that comfort zone of like, well, it looks good to me. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and not think enough about, you know, your user, your user base as like a holistic group. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you just finished demoing some stuff, but like, what what is it about Vercel? Is there like is there something specific about Vercel that really gets you excited, like personally, like you know, like mm -hmm. some feature or, or whatever? Yeah, I think. Like tell us about. Yeah, personally, one thing that I get really excited about from Vercel, not even as a Vercel employee, but just as somebody who has been following the brand, the product, the people since before I even worked here, I think is the overall focus on high quality output. So from the top down, I think a lot of almost, I mean, everybody at Vercel has this singular focus of how can we help create the best end user experience and what steps do we need to take to make that possible, whether it's decreasing the startup time in Next.js or decreasing the page weight of in Next.js pages or you know, having no layout shift on our dashboard or providing analytics to people who are trying to measure their site. It's all of these pieces for these front end teams who are collaborating to make better experiences. And they all work kind of seamlessly in unison together. And I think that's something that I'm particular, particularly really excited about that I was really initially hooked from the first time that I used the product when I just deployed from the command line actually, and it just went to production. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so easy. And then I, when we added the uh, like the the GUI for doing that through the the website. I was like, oh my gosh, this is even easier. It's just mind blowing to me how fast it is to get things off the ground. So I am personally super excited about that. Also super excited about kind of the, the future of Next.js and the adoption that we've seen and kind of the trajectory it's on. Uh, I feel like what we've been working on uh, as far as the framework level and the platform level has struck a chord with the community and I think that's why it's growing so quickly is because people are coming to similar conclusions on the apps they're building and they're needing to reach for the tools, whether it's Next.js or Vercel, the platform that we offer, they're, they're ending in that same conclusion that we did. So that's that's reassuring for me as well too. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think especially as we get, you know, as as the uh, the software world gets more and more decentralized, um, you know, it's really cool to have have companies like Vercel that are really focused on like creating good like and and like collaboration spaces for people who aren't necessarily yeah. co-located. Well, I, I mean, if you think about it, the back end is commoditized now. Everything that you need to do from a back end standpoint you can find a service or a SaaS that does exactly that for you, whether it's real time or you know, a database that you need or collaboration for something highly complex. Like a lot of these things are commoditized, especially with the rise of the API economy. I need payments, boom, Stripe. I need search, boom, Algolia. I need uh, SMS, boom, Twilio. Like whatever it is, like these things have been commoditized. I need to see a mess of store content. You know, you have like a hundred different choices. There's a lot of good options, right? But the point in saying that is as these things have grown as a product and market differentiator, the front end is where teams are winning. It's these immersive experiences that you're really seeing people win in the online space, especially uh, Vercel customers. We see a lot of people in e-commerce, a lot of people in ad back media. And for these customers, they have to have unique, compelling, fast experiences. So you see these you know, e-commerce websites that make it so easy, so frictionless, so fast to go from, oh, I want that to, boom, I check out. It, it's revolutionary. I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, there's a study in 2009 from Amazon that said every 100 milliseconds was leading to 1% less sales. So basically, even the smallest amount of optimizations at that scale made a huge, huge impact on their revenue. And interestingly enough, I've been researching this quite a bit. Then like three years later, Walmart basically came to the exact same conclusion on a study that they ran. And I mean, those things have only compounded and gotten more important since 2013 or 2009 or whatever. So it's, it is crazy how important the front end has become. It's really the differentiator now. Whoever wins at the front end, I think wins in 2021. That's, I mean, I totally agree. I think, you know, the, the slicker, the slicker your thing is and the fewer clicks it takes to get from, I want to do the thing to I'm doing the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's everything. It's everything. I mean, the yeah. fact that I can go in Vercel and say next JS project. And within, you know, the time it took for, for you to show me, to give me a quick tour of the analytics section, it, it was up and hosted and, and it, it's done. It's, it's there. And that's, it's, it's hard to articulate, I think how valuable that is. And going forward too, I'm just going to share my screen again one more time. Um, what we've been doing too is not only providing people an easy way to get started, but providing people super high quality starter kits that have baked in all of the best practices that we like. So for example, you're, what you're looking at here is Next.js Commerce high quality e-commerce store built with Next.js and big commerce support for Shopify launching very soon, as well as a bunch of other different e-commerce platforms to basically just plug and play. So it's built in a, uh, an agnostic way where you can switch out whichever one you want to use. And the crazy thing about this is people can just in one click, like initiate that same exact deployment process that I just showed and get an amazing high quality website and start delivering product value right away. And we're doing this in a bunch of different places. We have this for e-commerce. We have this one for uh, virtual events. We use the exact same platform to run Next.js conference. Um, and it, it works so well that we basically turn this into a starter kit. We also have um, Nextra, which is an awesome documentation generator, which we use to host our own documentation for SWR. So it, it really simplifies that entire process of getting a really good documentation site just basically throw some markdown in here and you're good to go. Like the, the layout's done for you, all these things. We wanna make it as easy as possible for, for people to hit the ground running with really high quality stuff. So these, so, so you pointed, you showed me the e-commerce st starter pack and you showed me the, the event starter pack. Do these come integrated with, with third-party services already? Like does the e-commerce starter pack come with a database and, and everything you need to, to you know, actually keep your products and stuff? in your inventory? Yeah, absolutely. So like specifically for the virtual event starter kit, right? Um, what we do is we have like a clone and deploy button that will kick this off. And what I'll do actually is I'll just pull up this GitHub link 
And, but I'll, I'll kick this off. And what it's going to do is say, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to deploy this project and we have a concept of integrations with the Vercel platform. So by default, what we're using here is Datto CMS. This is what we used for the Next.js conference platform. And that will work great. You can deploy with this, hook it up to a real CMS all in one flow. But then we also have support for a bunch of different CMS providers. So we have um, Agility, Contentful, Prismic, Sanity, Storyblock, and you know people are, are free to add more as they see it. It's all built in an agnostic way where people can just add a new file to add support for their CMS. So we've done the same thing uh, with the commerce one as well too. Like I mentioned, uh, started with big commerce. We're adding Shopify very soon, probably by the end of the month. And then there's a few more that are going to be right after that too. I mean, that's really cool. I mean, I think, I think if something like this had existed 10 years ago, when, when I was, you know, newly into this industry and, and thinking about maybe doing some freelance work here and there, and, you know, it just the, the barrier to entry sometimes like making just a website for, for a family friends, e-commerce business, or, you know, it's a, a, a real, like, you know, real, like local realtors and things like that, you know, who, who don't need flashy apps, but, but often need a lot of like, there's a lot of like design system overhead that, you know, me as somebody who's, who's always been more focused on the back ends of applications, didn't always want to get into. So kind of having these templates from Vercel that I just kind of go, okay, yeah, I like the look of this and I can use, you know, Dotto CMS. That's fine with me. Um, and just being able to, again, two or three clicks and you've got the thing. If you just wait 45 seconds for it to start up and then you can start <laughs> modifying. I mean, it's, there's an incredible amount of power there. And I think it's, it's really cool. Now I've seen you've got the pricing, the, the pricing up. Cause I think that's another part of this that a lot of engineers are going to be asking about is, oh, yeah. So quick thing on how much does it cost me to, to up, you have it, you have something you want to say. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. is, this is actually, uh, I just want to quickly share this. This is a unreleased, but soon to be released starter kit for launching your own site with subscription payments. Oh, cool. So we worked closely with the team at Superbase and Stripe. And then cool. this was actually used for a GitHub hackathon back in December. Um, but we're working on turning this into a more formal starter kit. But basically the exact same thing I showed for commerce and for documentation and for uh, virtual events, you're gonna be able to deploy in a few clicks and get immediately connected to Stripe, immediately connected to any database like Supabase in this example, and, and basically get a SaaS app immediately. So this is gonna be huge. It'll be launching sometime in the next couple of months. So I'm really, really excited about that as well. But yeah, uh, what you were talking about was pricing for Vercel. So one of the awesome things about Vercel, uh, it has a really, really good free tier. So you have a concept of a personal account or a hobby account and that's free forever. So you can use it to deploy your test projects, your side projects, your personal domain. I use it to host all of my little pet projects in my my own personal website. And you basically get to take advantage of all the hard stuff that Vercel has done for you, like whether that's adding domains really easily or you know the integration with Git, our CDN, adding serverless functions, all these different types of things um, you basically get for free. And then when you want to scale that, and go further, you can take it to our paid plans, which are either uh, a pro plan, which is 20 bucks a month per member, uh, or you know, chat with our sales team about what it might look like for enterprise, depending on how big your team is. And in terms of enterprise, you guys are just offering kind of a package deal for, for you know, Vercel.com versus actually selling an enterprise product that's hosted behind, behind firewalls and things like that? Um, not exactly. So really the enterprise product, it is access to, like you mentioned, like Vercel.com SaaS product to be able to deploy and manage your builds and collaborate with people and share preview deployments. But then it's also the features that you would expect as an enterprise customer, whether that's on one hand, the support piece. So guarantees for SLAs and working with our teams. On the other hand, it is working directly with our engineers, our support engineers, solutions architects, people like myself, to make sure that your application is performing well uh, over time too. And then also advanced security features that you would need for the level of um, running an enterprise, so whether that's like a, a web firewall in front of it or you know some sort of allow listing for IP addresses or you know all sorts of different things. The list goes on pretty far, but 
for people at that scale, they those features are basically necessary. Like they need sure. SAML and they need, uh, you know, all those type of things. Yep. That's cool. Um, it's nice that you guys can, can still offer this same level of, of, you know, simplicity to, to enterprise because enterprises, you know, a lot of people look at these platforms and go, this is cool, but like, what about my security? And what about, you know, mm -hmm. all, all the requirements we have as a business. So it's great that you guys are also able to kind of bridge that gap and, and provide the, you know, yeah. the crazy easy. I, I've, th I have this conversation pretty much every day because uh, working as a, so I do solutions as well as DevRel here at Vercel. And part of being on a call with people telling them more about the Purcell platform is helping educate them on what that enterprise offering entails. And for a lot of, you know, the larger organizations that we work with, it's things like us being SOC 2 compliant that are like table stakes for them. Like they absolutely need yeah. to have that and things like that just come as part of our, our enterprise package. So yeah, it's enterprise software is a different world. I'm learning more every day. That's very true. That's very true. So you, you, you've showed us a bunch, you know, everything that Vercel can do and you, and you showed us, you know, kind of what, what excites you about Vercel and, and, and told us about who, who should be using Vercel, but like, what's next for Vercel? Like, what, are there any like new features that you're excited about coming down the line that you can tell us about? Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I'm particularly excited about is we're treating uh, the future of Vercel as developers or scientists. This is kind of this mantra that we have now. So we talked about develop, preview, ship. Uh, but then in that iteration piece, what comes next, right? We have analytics, measuring things. Developers are scientists and they want to track and tweak and adjust inputs and run A-B tests and run experiments and use feature flags. And they, they want to do all these things to serve up different variations of their site or different permutations, ideally from the edge and to make it as easy as possible to see what's working, what's not working, and give the best experience to their customers. And that's something that we're thinking a lot more about going into the future um, from a Vercel side. From a Next.js side, there's a ton of really exciting stuff in the works. Uh, one of the things, and uh, with Next.js, it's all open source. So if you subscribe on uh, GitHub, you get to get notified when releases happen. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is I've recently spent quite a bit of time like researching in font loading and font optimizations and the best way to do fonts, which is why I talked about like CLS and font display optional. And what we want to do is take all of that and put it directly in Next.js so that you don't have to do that yourself. Like we want to make it easy for you to have the best performance and the best uh, experience for your customers. And we want to keep doing that over and over and over. So uh, the future of Next.js, at least for the next it changes quickly like we add things really quickly which is great um shout out to our the next gs team they they're all incredible um but when i say future i'm thinking like the next three months um there's going to be lots of good additions there as well as addressing some pain points in the community and you know bug fixes and things like that so pretty excited about that that's 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 exciting to hear you know i, I always love any any organization or our you know, development group or our core team or whoever who can really respond and is dedicated to responding quickly to the user base and mm -hmm. kind of like, a, like you said, addressing pain points and mm -hmm. um, introducing, you know, new things that people are asking for. It can be, it can be difficult. And especially, you know, yeah. since you guys do have both like that convergence of, of, you know, we have a platform, a hosting platform, but then we also can provide you you know, this development platform as well, which is tightly integrated together. That's going to give you a, a great experience, both online, like hosting your site and offline, quote unquote, when you're, when you're developing. Um, yeah. I, I mean, just building off that, like we make the best place to host your Next.js applications, but Next.js is also an open source framework and we want to make it so, you know, every feature that is released through running Next Start uh, as long as you're using a Node.js server, you're going to be able to take advantage of those features. So, you know, some of the other guests that you'll be chatting with, you know, whether it's like a DigitalOcean or AWS Amplify or Netlify or whatever, like they can support running um, Next.js as well. And the intention there is, you know, you put it with a Node.js server and, and everything works. So specifically for Vrizel, we have optimizations on top for running it in a serverless architecture. But if you want to self-host Next.js, which lots of people do, like, for example, 
Apple uses Next.js, they're not going to use Vercel probably. I would love right. it if they did, but they're <laughs> probably not going to. So they have to self-host Next.js. Um, and we, we still need to obviously support that and make that work very well. So it's, yeah, I love, I love any platform that, you know, offers the fact that you guys offer this next, you know, this tool of next JS that you're saying like, Hey, Vercel is the best place to host this because it's got the features you want. Mm -hmm. But you know, if, if that doesn't meet your business needs at some point, you know, like take your next JS app and host it elsewhere. I mean, that's fine with mm -hmm. us. I think, I think that really goes a long way with developers. Mm -hmm. be, to be so confident in your product that you'll offer them tools that they can take somewhere else if they want and not mm -hmm. have to, you know, so you're not locking people in to, well, you use our tool chain, so you have to use our service. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really cool. And it says a lot about how confident Vercel is in their offering. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm personally trying to do a better job too of educating the community on these things because, you know, the Next.js team is very busy and I'm coming in to kind of help with, some of that education piece so people understand that if you can run a next or if you can run a Node.js server, like you can run Next.js and understand overall more holistically, like how we go about developing the Next.js platform, why we support the things we support. And on top of that, I'm working on trying to add better guidance around self-hosting. So people don't feel like they hit our documentation and it says, okay, we'll deploy to Vercel. Like we want to give people a good path, whether they want to use Vercel or they don't want to use Vercel. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at something that's that's you know a tool that's made by a hosting company, and mm -hmm. going, oh, this seems cool, and then like, oh yeah, but like you can write on your own thing, but nobody's gonna help you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's I, I I love it. I love I love that you guys are really putting developers first and not necessarily saying our bottom line is the most important thing. You're telling mm -hmm. developers use these tools. We're confident in them, and we're so confident in them in our own our own tools that, hey, if you want to go somewhere else, like be our guest, but we don't yeah. recommend it. Yeah, and it really comes back to from the top down from Guillermo, like a, a deep rooted experience in open source. I mean, he's been involved in open source for many, many years, creating tons of popular libraries, working with like Mongoose and Socket.io and things like that. Um, so he, he gets it, he understands. And he also luckily, I feel fortunate to work for Vercel because they also care about supporting the open source community. So, you know, whether that's contributing back to like Babel and Webpack and other things that would like, you know, Next.js isn't, po Next JS isn't possible without a Babel or a Webpack. So we have to bring up that community, those open source contributors who work so hard to provide the the bedrock for for all modern web apps. There's there's a meme somewhere. It's like all modern JS infrastructure, and that's like one random guy in Nebraska like supporting it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that was one of the really big things about Heroku that I loved. I was doing a lot of when I was using Heroku heavily. I was doing a lot of Ruby on Rails development, and they really as a company embraced Ruby and really you know ultimately brought it underneath their wheelhouse so they could make sure that you know they were clued in and were the best platform for for Ruby, but like, you know, they're not going to stop you from re using Ruby wherever the heck else you can use it. But mm -hmm. Heroku is always going to be the best platform because we're tied in to what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. Like you guys, you know, with, with Next.js, I think it's incredible. So we're about at time for today's episode. Lee, thank you so much. Uh, I think we've learned a lot about Vercel and Next.js, and I think there's a lot for, for developers to get excited about. Uh, so thanks again for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. It was great to chat about all these different things. Let's do it again sometime. All right, yeah, <laughs> sounds good, man. I'd love to. Awesome, thank you. My pleasure, take care.